happy people in the world. Uh, all you have to do is drive any road in Sutherland or anywhere else. Uh, people are uptight and unhappy. You go to the store and they're pushing their way into lines and stuff. But, you know, I remember that uh, when I was just a young Christian in the uh, early 70s, uh, we used to sing this song a cappella because uh, Psalm 144.15 says, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. You remember this one? Happy, 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 happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Happy, 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 happy are the people whose God is the Lord. My way is brighter, my way is lighter, walking up the King's highway. His grace I'm knowing, His love I'm showing, I'm walking up the King's highway. And it's a highway to heaven, none can go up there but the pure in heart. It's a highway to heaven, and I'm walking up the King's highway. Way. Good job, choir. Now, some are as old as Jeff and Kathy and remembered that song uh, from, uh, but thank you for helping me out. I can always count on the two of you. You're so wonderful. And by the way, happy birthday, Pastor Jeff. For those of you who may be watching online, Pastor Jeff uh, turned uh, <clears throat> last night and uh, <laughs> So we celebrated his birthday, and we're celebrating it again this evening. Thank you, Pastor John and Cammie. We are so blessed to have uh, people in this church that really love the Lord, love the Word, know the Word, and are living out the Word. You see, the Bible tells us that's the recipe for happiness. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. But I won't uh, bother you with words of my own wisdom. Let's ask the Lord to do exactly what only he can do. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We're so grateful that you haven't left us in the dark. You are the light of the world, and you illuminate what we're doing and where we're going and who we are. And Lord, I pray that, Father, you would anoint the words that we read and impact them in our hearts and minds, and that, Lord, as we spend time in your presence, that you do exactly what only you can do. Paul said, I didn't come with the words of my own wisdom, but with fear and trembling and demonstrations of the spirit and power. Jesus, you said yourself, it would not be necessary that any man teach your disciples, but the Holy Spirit, when he came, would lead us into all truth, remind us of the things that you have said, and show us things to come. So we're declaring our dependence upon you tonight and pray that, Lord, you give your church ears to hear what you want to say to us. And all of God's kids said, amen, amen, amen. amen. I'm a musician, so I love the Psalms. I love David and all that he wrote. You know, all we have left is the lyrics, but they're wonderful lyrics. So if you have your Bible, would you turn to Psalm 1, the first Psalm? Did you guys have a great 4th of July? Yeah. I, I got to tell you, I, I was really uh, uh, kind of just wanted to rest and relax because I'm on the road so much. And so Vicki and I were just enjoying uh, a time at home on Monday. And we thought, you know, fireworks are a big thing. So we looked online and found out that uh, the public broadcasting system was uh, broadcasting th the Capitol Fourth. So we streamed that at home. And what a wonderful program of music and patriotism and the Lord. I mean, Yolanda Adams standing in front of the Lincoln Memorial celebrating its 100th anniversary. It was dedicated on July 4th, 100 years ago, uh, singing the battle hymn of the Republic. You know, this nation was founded upon a great foundation. And it was Thomas Jefferson who, uh, along with Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, wrote uh, the Declaration of Independence, which was uh, introduced to Congress on July 4, 1776. It was not ratified, actually, till a little later. But they signed it, and remember that preamble to the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator, not their government, but endowed by their creator 
with certain unalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's interesting that they use that word, pursuit of happiness. We all want to be happy, don't we? I want to tell you, if you're not happy tonight as you arrive, I pray and trust that you'll leave happy. When you're, not just because my message is over, but that you'll be happy. You'll be happy that not just because you get to leave, but that you'll be refreshed. Do you know the Bible has you? You are in the Bible. Did you know that? Every person who has ever lived and who ever will live is somewhere to be found in the Holy Scriptures. But I'm going to take you to a passage a little later and, uh, the, and allow you to see yourself in the Word of God. But let's turn to Psalm 1. Now, the word that's translated here in our English versions, blessed, is a Hebrew word that David used that literally could be translated, oh, how happy. And I'm going to use that translation. Oh, how happy is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. David wrote this psalm, but it was read by all of the children of Israel. Uh, it was treasured by the Jewish people. And uh, I want to remind you that there was one particular Jewish fella who had been schooled in the most prestigious school of his time. His name was Saul of Tarsus, but he met Jesus Christ in a dramatic way on the road to Damascus, and we know him as Paul the Apostle. And while he was in prison at Rome, I believe he was meditating on this psalm. Well, how do you know, Denny? You weren't there. No, I wasn't. But there's evidence that I'd like to introduce to you for your consideration. Turn with me to Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus. Paul's letter to the Christians in Ephesus. You know, it's just amazing to me. I have discovered over the years that the master weaver takes every little thread, the monumental and the microscopic, the, the mundane and the magnificent, and he weaves these threads together, creating this wonderful trap, tapestry uh, of, of human history, which is an awesome sight to behold as he weaves our lives together and his eternal plan for each and every one of us. So why do you believe that Paul was meditating on this first psalm, Denny, when he wrote the book, this letter to the believers in uh, Ephesus? Because the theme of Ephesus is just like the theme of Psalm 1. Remember, David wrote about sitting, walking, and standing. Where are you seated? Where do you walk? Where do you stand? Well, Paul takes up that theme, and over and over in this wonderful epistle, this letter, he talks about where we're seated and where we're to walk and how we're to stand. In fact, it begins right at the very beginning of chapter 2 in, in Ephesus. We sang it. And I, that's the part of the Master Weaver's work. We didn't conspire with Rachel as she put together the worship list, but that last song, did you notice the line? Seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, beginning at verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, 
made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Isn't that amazing? You see yourself, Wendy, sitting there right next to Camille in those chairs, uh, and, but you're seated right now in heavenly places. You're in heavenly places. You might not be conscious of that fact. You might not be aware, but it's important to be aware and important to remind us your position in Jesus Christ. It's already been done. It's not some future event that we have to anticipate and wait for. It is the present reality, Lisa. I've seen you Sunday after Sunday sitting on that little hard bench for both services and playing and tickling those ivories as only you can do. But while you're seated there, remember, you are seated, girl, in heavenly places. You are seated. Can you imagine how the angels and how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit see you? We're so concerned about how others perceive us, how others see us. I think the most important question is, how does God see us? What does he see when he looks at you? What does he see, Jeannie, when he looks at you? He sees you here. There's no doubt about it. Your condition is obvious to him, but you, your position is about the throne room of heaven. You are seated presently in heavenly places. Oh, and it's 9 o'clock. Wouldn't your life be different if every moment of every day you reminded yourself, hold on a second, I'm stuck in, I, I have to cover five different states for uh, the organization I work for, and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and sadly that takes me to many big cities like Seattle and Portland. And it is so miserable to be stuck behind idiots behind the wheel <laughs> on the freeway you know, at all hours of the day and night, where are these people coming from and where are they going and why are they in my way? <laughs> you know, I, the, my car, because I spend so much time in it, has become my prayer closet. And I have to remember when I'm steering, Lance, the, 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 the car that, that, number one, I am currently and presently seated in heavenly places, so I'd better watch out what I say about those people and the cars in front of me. And I ought to be elevated from the frustration and the tendency to give in to my flesh. Uh, I need to recognize and realize that God sees me in his throne room, seated in heavenly places. Now, Denny, act like it. Do you get the point? Do you understand what I'm saying? Did, did you hear what I just said? Because remember, there's a test. Okay. But not only are we seated in heavenly places, but because we are seated in heavenly places, we don't have to do like David said and walk along with the mockers and the wicked of the day. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul says these words in verse 1 through 3, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, remember he wrote this from prison in Rome, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Our walk, in other words, our conduct, our condition in the world, ought to be a direct result of our awareness of where we are. I mean, my goodness, we are here presently seated in church, and those of you who are at home, probably comfortable on your couch or whatever, but remember, we're seated in heavenly places. Therefore, our conduct and our condition ought to be a direct result of our awareness of where we are. We ought to walk worthy. You're a child of the King, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Start acting like it. Start walking like that. Start walking through this terrible, dark world, like Paul would later say, among whom you shine 
as bright lights in the midst of a perverse and crooked country and nation. Walk like you are seated in heaven, because you are seated in heavenly places right now. Oh, someday you'll be there physically, but you are there presently spiritually. There's a wonderful connection that Christians oftentimes uh, forget that, that, that reality is more than just what our senses tell us. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we feel. Um, the re present reality is God is right here in this building. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am, the same Jesus, Jennifer, who walked the streets of Jerusalem, the shores of Galilee, and healed every person that cried out to him, delivered the demonic, and set the captives free, uh, gave sight to the blind, and life to those who had already been taken into that, that, that realm of death. In chapter 5, if you would like to turn there, Ephesians 5.2 Here's a, a clearer focus of what Paul meant by walking worthy of the calling. He says, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now, this word love is one of several Greek words. This is the Greek word agape. This is that all-giving, absolutely selfless love of God. Walk in that love. Now, it's interesting. You said, Jenny, that you, know, you thought Paul was meditating on, uh, on Psalm 1 when, when, he, when he was writing this letter. And that's firmly my belief. Think with me. I don't know about you, but I, I love orchards, fruit orchards. I want to tell you, have you seen the signs? Cherries, fresh cherries. I can't hardly wait till the fall when it's, Fresh peaches. I, I, I'm sure that the forbidden fruit on the tree was a chocolate-covered peach. <laughs> I mean, she saw it and said, boy, this looks delicious, and it's desirable for food. Well, who wouldn't agree chocolate's a desirable food, right? But I love peaches. I, when, when, Vicki will tell you, I go crazy. We buy peaches by the lug. Uh, from an orchard I'm not going to tell you about. And uh, he's up in Salem, but that's as far as I'll go. And he's got these old uh, Alberta peach trees. And I love Albertas. My mom, my grandma, Dolores canned them when I was a little boy. And they are so yummy and so delicious. And, and I eat them fresh. Slice them in the morning on your cereal. Slice them in the evening on your ice cream. Slice them fresh. Eat them out of the... I mean, just eat them all the time because they're only fresh for a little while. Well, where do those peaches come from? Christina, a tree produces fruit, but it doesn't do calisthenics. <laughs> oh, I've got to produce some fruit here. Better get busy, man. <laughs> Struggling, dance. <laughs> Squeeze that one out. <laughs> you know, a tree, that's, that's the paradigm that, think with me, the paradigm that David used. He shall be like a tree planted by the river. Delbert, what does a tree do? It stands there with its roots deep in the soil and drinks the nutrients and the wonderful elixir of H2O out of that earth. And that liquid by osmosis comes up through the trunk and out, Lisa, into the branches and then... Little blossoms come out, and the bees zzz, around the flowers, and they're pollinated, and then <laughs> I'm going to tell you, we were in, we, Medford used to be a, 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 a wonderful, wonderful place in Oregon where you could get really good peaches, but they've cut down all the orchards, and now there's vineyards everywhere. Um, but, but Vicki and I used to go to this you-pick uh, place in, in Medford, where our little son, Ben, it took two of his hands to pick, uh, Heather, one of those fresh peaches and pull it off the tree, and then he'd come over and drop it in the little box that we had, and we'd buy them by the lug. 
And I know where you're all going. You're going to get peach pie later, right? <laughs> but think with me. A tree doesn't have to work to produce fruit. Be like a tree. Send your roots deep into the word of God, into the living water, and drink from the wells of salvation, and let that wonderful nutrition just well up inside of you and produce the fruit of love, overflowing power of God's Spirit. We oftentimes get so focused on the power of God's Spirit that we forget there's the fruit of the Spirit. And it comes supernaturally just by having your roots in the living water and your branches lifted in worship to the S-O-N and then fruit. We see it develop in your life and we all get to partake. Remember Jesus said on that wonderful day, Come to me, all you that thirst. And out of your innermost, he had to scream, there were thousands of people there. And out of your innermost being will gush torrents of living water. And John says parenthetically, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let the Holy Spirit not only gift you and empower you, but let the Holy Spirit give you the fruit of the Spirit which is that all-giving, supernatural, godly love. And walk in that love. In Ephesians 5, 8, he also says that walking in the Spirit is a walk in wisdom. In verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul wrote, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Remember, Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, burdened down, Lou, by the things of life and time and effort, and realize, come unto me. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly, and you will find rest, Dale, unto your souls. Walking in love, walking in light is not a lone, solitary march through life are you yoked together with the master now remember Vicky and I have been to Israel many many times there aren't a lot of trees in Israel okay all of the homes built in the time of Jesus were not made of wood like we see here in the Pacific Northwest Teresa they were made of stone Rhonda uh, you know stone because there's stone everywhere in Israel it's a very stony place you can see it everywhere. And, and they built the houses out of stone. A carpenter, in the time of Jesus, his main occupation was building carts, means of transportation and hauling things, and building yokes. Yokes had to be custom designed because uh, the people were poor. They, they didn't have two matched oxen to pull the cart. Uh, they would have a strong ox and a weak ox and so the yoke would be carefully custom designed so that when fitted on the strong and the weak ox the cart wouldn't go in a curve because the bigger stronger guy is pushing all the time and the little weak one's trying to keep up they would walk in a straight line and so let the one who is the master the one who can bear every burden let him be your partner as you walk through life. He's right beside you. Even while you're seated in heavenly places, he's right there with you. Take my yoke upon you. He wasn't being just uh, analytical. He was being very practical. Let me be your partner. Let me be the strong ox. You be the weak ox. But the yoke that I'm designed specifically and uniquely for you is perfectly designed so that when we walk together we're going to go through the straight and the narrow no turning to the left no turning to the right we're going to go straight so we're to walk in love and we're to walk in light and finally in ephesians 5 15 and 16 paul writes see then that you walk circumspectly a better translation would be wisely 
not as fool, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We are to walk in wisdom. Wisdom. Anybody remember the proverb? The beginning of wisdom is what? Thank you, John. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, what's the fear of the Lord? Well, Solomon also defined that term in Proverbs when he says the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Unfortunately, because of our fleshly human nature, we're kind of intrigued by evil. We like to kind of toy with it, don't we? Like it's a toy or an amusement. But wisdom begins when we start hate. You know, God hates evil. Why does he hate evil? Because evil's bad? Oh, it certainly is. But I really believe that God hates evil because of what it does to the objects of his affection. He loves you so much. He wants to protect you from those foolish choices that only bring self-destruction and damage to ourselves. Oh, he loves you so much. So we're to walk worthy of the calling. We're to walk in love, walk in the light, and walk in wisdom. And finally, to our test. Everybody got a pen? Did you, did you finally get a pen? Wonderful. Turn with me in your Bible, if you have it, to Ephesians chapter 2. If you're already in Ephesians, it'll be easy. Ephesians chapter 2. I want to point out to you that you are in the Bible. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, a lot's been said in our woke culture, our counterculture right now, about the use of pronouns, he, she, they, you, all that stuff. I, I believe that that's actually because the evil one doesn't want us to identify ourselves the way that he sees us. You know, when God looks at the sinner, he doesn't look with disdain. He looks with love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have ever lasting life. God, Peter says, don't be, don't be uh, confused. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God looks upon the sinner through the eyes of Jesus Christ, who on the cross said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The fool has said in his heart, no, God, and what do fools do? <laughs> we do foolish stuff. The Bible actually says that before we were born again, we were literally dead in our trespasses and sin. I want you to read this with me. Would you read it out loud? And I'm going to skip that little part in verse 1 where it's in italics in, in your scriptures. Uh, he has made alive. The, the translators actually added that. It doesn't appear in the original manuscript. So I'm going to read it as it appears in the original manuscript. And you who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of a disobedience, among whom also you once conducted themselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature a child of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead in trespasses, made you alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised you up together, and made you sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kingdom toward you in Christ Jesus. For by grace 
you have been saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. And now the test. Delbert, would you, would you help me? Christina, would you help me? Would you make sure that everybody gets a copy of this test? You won't have to turn it in. There is no failing grade for this test. But I want, Vicki, would you also help, please, and pass these out? I want everyone to get a copy. And for those of you who are watching online, I'm sorry I can't uh, share this with you, but I'm going to ask uh, Delbert if you wouldn't mind taking one up to the camera and uh, letting folks see uh, what. Now, this is a fill-in-the-blank test, okay? It's not hard. It's not difficult. But I want you to honestly consider exactly how you fit in to this passage that Paul wrote thousands of years ago. So everyone gets a copy of the test. Make sure you all have a pen. Make sure. And once everyone has, please don't take the test until everyone has been given the test. And then we will complete the test together. And I can guarantee you that the answers are personal. And so I want you to take this test honestly and consider exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you through your participation in this exercise. And then I want you to take uh, the test and keep it. And whenever you are discouraged, I want you to consider rereading what you have written in that test. You see, oftentimes we read the scriptures and we believe or think that they apply to someone else, that they apply to, to someone of, of historic importance or somebody that's important even now, but you are in the Bible. So I'm going to help some of you complete this test. And John, who was dead in trespasses and sin, in which Jamie once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of a disobedience, among whom also Jennifer once conducted herself in the lusts of her flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature a child of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved Lou, even when Lou was dead in trespasses, made Delbert alive together with Christ. By grace, Christina has been saved and raised Vicky up together and made Rachel sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly riches of his grace in his kindness toward Dale in Christ Jesus. For by grace, Jeannie, has been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest Jennifer should boast. For Denny is his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that Teresa should walk in them. Now, I hope you didn't put all those different names in there. I'm trying, Art, you are so stupid. Um, I don't know how Wanda puts up with you. But I love you, brother, because you're seated in heavenly places. I hope it's a long way from where I'm seated, but that's okay. So, you, Camille, did you write every blank? Did you fill, Wendy, did you, every blank? Now, think about that for a minute. Think about how, think how wonderful this statement, this is the word of God for you, Thelma. Think about it, girl. Merle, think about it. Doesn't this describe, I, I titled it my testimony, but it's not my testimony, it's your testimony. It's our testimony. Wouldn't it be wonderful, I believe revival comes 
when individual people understand their position in Christ and begin to live it out in the condition, in the way that they walk, Ruth, through every day of every week, of every month, Becca, of every year. When you really understand, precious person, who you are in Christ Jesus, it makes, Lisa, all the difference. It makes all the difference. No wonder we sing, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Now notice the tense of this writing. This is not future tense. This is present perfect tense tense. The, this is the reality, Jeff, right here, right now, about Pastor Jeff. Regardless of your opinion about Art or Jeff, know this. They are the ones whom Christ has come to save. And it's all right here in black and white. May God grant us the ability to realize who each... Now think about this. If you start writing other people's name in this, no, no, listen to me very carefully. When I get upset at my girl, and I do, <laughs> when we really get upset, we spit at each other, but like cats do, you know, but it's a cat fight for sure. But when I remember, and Vicky who was dead in trespasses and sin, in which Vicky once walked, also Vicky once conducted herself because of the great love which she loved Vicky, even when Vicky was dead in trespasses, made Vicky alive together with Christ. By grace, Vicky has been saved and raised Vicky up together and made Vicky sit together in the heavenly places. How can I treat her badly? She's a child of the king, a daughter of heaven. She is my bride. And please understand, I hold you in the utmost regard, love. You know I do. You're my sister, my lover, my spouse, my best friend. I'm so blessed. I'm married to my best friend. There's not a person on the planet I would rather spend time with on the world than Vicki. She's the perfect sandpaper when I need. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. You guys are married. You understand this. She's the per when, she can rub me the wrong way like nobody on the planet. I'm just being honest right now, okay? Lori, you know exactly what I mean, don't you, girl? I, I know it. You do, Lance. And you're proud of it, too, aren't you? I know, yeah. But she's also the bomb of Gilead. She's that ointment, that oil that covers my wounds and soothes me in my little aches and pains. She even washes my stinky undies. I mean, come on, people. <laughs> Can you put them in the bag first before you put them on the floor? <laughs> we've had a lot of fun this evening, I believe, because we've talked about being happy. Heather, this is the recipe for happiness. Regardless of circumstances, regardless of pressure, regardless of problems, illness, injury, catastrophe, this is a way for you to be happy. Don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Don't stand in the way of sinners. Don't walk in the way of the wicked. See yourself just as Paul saw those believers in Ephesus. You're seated together in heavenly places. And he has saved you by his love and by his grace. Aren't you glad Jesus came? Aren't you glad that he's here with us now? And don't you know... Have any of you guys any vacation plans this summer? Anybody willing to admit you're making vacation plans? You're going somewhere? Where are you guys going? Where? Yellowstone? Wow, yeah. It's, they've had some problems with flooding. What a beautiful, beautiful place. That's great. Now, did you get some, like, brochures and do some research about what it's like to go to Yellowstone? Okay. Are everybody getting excited? Can't wait, right? Guess what? We get to go to heaven. All expense paid, and it lasts forever. 
and there's food there and fun, pleasures at his right hand evermore. So when you get down and discouraged, when you feel sad, don't just sing zippity doo da zippity a. Don't sing, just be happy, be happy. Go to this passage. I, I, I invite you to take this test with you. And, and don't just toss it in the round file when you go home. Fold it up, put it in your Bible. And the next time you're feeling sad, get it out and read the places where you filled in the blanks. Because this is the truth about you, Wendy. Jennifer, this is the truth about you. Vicki, this is the truth about you. Dale, it's the truth. It's fact. It's a fact. It's actual. Matter of fact, it's satisfactual. <laughs> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, not to leave us in the hopeless condition, lost and dead in our trespasses and sins, going about fulfilling the flesh and the lusts of the flesh like sons of disobedience. But your great love called us out from the darkness and you've seated us together in heavenly places. Lord, you're so gracious and so good. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but by your mercy you've saved us. And Lord, now you've called us to walk in those works which you've foreordained beforehand. So Lord, help us to realize where we're sitting at every moment, at every opportunity, and help us to walk worthy of that place. Walk in love and walk in the light and walk in wisdom. And Lord, help us to stand. Help us to stand in the evil day as Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the spiritual forces of darkness that are at work in the world. And we're not of the world. Oh, we're in the world, but we're not of it. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be sitting and standing and walking according to your word. And that, Lord, you would revive us so that the condition of our walk, the condition of our stand, the condition of where we are positioned in this world will be a direct result of our awareness of what you've done for us and where we are presently seated. So Lord, thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for King David who wrote Psalm 1 and Paul who read it and really helped us understand it more fully. Now, Lord, bless your children, give us your favor, and help us, Lord, to enjoy being happy in the midst of a sad, sad world. In Jesus' name, and all of God's kids said, Amen. 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 The next time I walk through a peach orchard, I'm going to be hearing Pastor Denny's sound effects. How many else know what I'm talking about, you know? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Did you enjoy that tonight?